There's lots of ways of investigating the health service. Um, it's a public body, therefore you can access information, sometimes through a press officer if you're, you are the press, but also through the freedom of information um, legislation. Um, one of the problems is at the moment the NHS is undergoing lots of change, so at one time you would have asked your primary care trust for all manner of information, so that might be linked to GPs, it might be linked to data from hospitals, it might be linked to the number of operations they've paid for or where their healthcare spend has gone, who's received what money for example. But obviously this is changing and, and the way health is commissioned within the NHS is changing. Um, but there still should be, even when the private sector is providing information to the NHS, you should be able to get it information through the Freedom of Information Act. Also, you can apply directly to hospitals, foundation trusts, trusts um, to see maybe what kinds of procedures that they've been performing, what kinds of equipment they've been buying in, um, and they'll keep a, a wealth of data on their books. Um, you can also apply to universities with any kind of health arm um, for data about research. You might want to ask for minutes from research ethics committees or you might, you know, there's a huge amount of information. But then going up to, for example, the Department of Health, you might want to know kind of rationale for healthcare spend, for example. So when we did an investigation into Tamiflu, and, and which was stockpiled in huge quantities um, for the pandemic, um, we asked for emails between the Chief Exec of the NHS and the um, Secretary of State um, and the Chief Medical Officer looking at reasons for why they stockpiled Tamiflu in such, so many quantities and who they met with. What I would say about accessing um, emails is you really do need to know what you're asking for. Um, Organisations will turn down your request if, if any real opportunity and if it requires a lot of effort on their behalf, a lot of time, a lot of expense, they'll knock back your freedom of information request and I'd say don't really go for fishing um, expeditions, really try and bottom out what you're asking for first if you want any kind of success. The other kinds of things that you might ask for are minutes of meetings and that can give you all sorts of information. Um, you might want uh, minutes of meetings from our drug regulator, the MHRA, and that can yield all sorts of inter interesting information. But again, don't do a, do a fishing trip. What you might find and what we found is certain things are considered commercial in confidence. Um, so um, you'll have swathes of information that are blacked out and you can have discussions, you can speak to the information officer about whether that is legitimately commercial in confidence. But what's worth remembering as well, and this is something that we found in an investigation that we did in, with um, dispatches that went out in May, is that there are certain sections of the um, legislature, um, there are, sorry, there are pieces of legislation that trump the Freedom of Information Act, so medical device legislation. So medical devices might be something as simple as a sticking plaster, but it all might, might also might be a pacemaker that goes into the heart or a hip implant. Um, so it does cover a wide number of things that are used in health. And actually, that piece of legislation trumps the Freedom of Information Act. So we were asking for basic stuff from the MHRA about adverse reactions to these to, to hip implants as it was and, and some cochlear implants and um, they were turned down on, on commercial and confidence and actually that is what the legislation says we could have fought it if we'd have had more time and, and questioned it but the legislation is there but when it comes to drugs because there are different pieces of legislation that govern medical devices and, and drugs um, clinical data is allowed under the Freedom of Information Act. Obviously, you know, you have to think about data protection and patient data. I mean, you, should, you wouldn't be able to get that anyway because data protection um, stops that. Um, but you should be able to get a huge amount of information on drugs. And if not from the MHRA, but from the European regulator known as the European Medicines Agency, and they're subject to the Freedom of Information Act. You might want to think about also decisions made at the European level um, to do with healthcare. Their um, health body is known as DG Sanko, um, and there's all sorts of decisions that are made in the European Commission and the European Parliament. You might want to get money about 
who's funding the MEPs, which companies are funding the MEPs, and so on and so forth, because that can yield all sorts of interesting uh, results. There are also lobby groups as well, um, and obviously you have to treat those with suitable caution. Um, for example, Health Action International, Oxfam, they might have all sorts of information, Medicine Sans Frontier, um, patient groups, but again, they, they do have an agenda and it's always worth, if there is a statement, they put out a statement asking them what that statement, what evidence that statement was based on. Um, patient groups, but again, treat with care because they're often funded by um, drug companies, device companies, all sorts of all companies, and that might affect their um, lobbying and, and their, their statements. So for example, history is replete with examples where patient groups have been fighting for a drug and you find out the drug company is funding that patient group. Um, I would always say with health, be careful and about over-interpreting data. So for example, if you get um, statistics that suggest that maybe more people are dying from a certain um, operation in Liverpool than they are in Surrey, um, you might have to take into account that perhaps Liverpool's poorer, there's more complicated, what we say in medicine, case mix. So patients might have more underlying risk factors. So the two really aren't comparable. You can't really draw many conclusions other than saying, for some reason, more patients are dying from this operation in Liverpool than they are in Surrey. You can't really interpret any further than that um, because you, you need more data. Also, again, be careful before you lobby and say, well, you know, the postcode lottery, people are getting this treatment here, but they're not getting it here. Don't assume that the people that aren't getting it are getting a worse deal. It might be that actually the drug isn't that much good in the first place. So it's always worth seeing what NICE say, and NICE often gets a bad press, but so many drugs are overhyped. And actually when you evaluate the evidence, they don't really stack up to much. So I'd, I'd say avoid falling down the trap of just assuming just because someone gets something, they're the lucky ones and those that don't get something are the unlucky ones. So you really do need to think about the big kind of big healthcare picture. You can't be having good sources. I mean, that's and particularly in health because they can help you interpret any information that you get because it is easy to jump to conclusions but when you really analyse it there's lots of expl explanations for why you're seeing what you're seeing I'm not saying there isn't a story there but just be cautious also and that brings me on to experts and their conflicts of interest don't just assume because an expert's at a university or at a hospital a professor at a hospital that you're going to get impartial advice um, we've seen time and time again that um, experts with commercial ties to companies, conflicts of interest, competing interests, whatever you want to call them, mightn't give you impartial advice. Their advice will be loaded. That is something that they should declare if they're ever consulting for NICE, if they're ever consulting for the MHRA, if they're ever consulting for the Department of Health, they're supposed to fill in um, a declaration of interest statement saying if they do, if they have any research funded by companies, if they have any stocks and shares in the companies and actually organisations are supposed to vet these declarations of interest. Now I'm not saying they always do as we found out with a, a story that we did on the World Health Organisation to, to do with Tamiflu despite them having legislation in place to um, exclude people with conflicts of interest. Um, they were still using them and not, not making them public. So conflicts of interest should be made public as well. So again, if you, if you consult an expert, do bear in mind or do ask them directly what their conflicts of interest are. And if they submitted stuff to medical journals, this question should not come as a surprise. Um, you have to be, think about that the whole time. Lawyers, medical litigation lawyers are also another source of information. But again, treat with caution. You need to treat all sources with, with you know, a relative amount of, of scepticism. Um, their job isn't necessarily to fairly reflect what the evidence says, but win a case for a person or a patient. And that, I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but if you are using it as an objective source, you just have to bear in mind that they do have um, an agenda. Um, again, same with blogs, same with um, communities. Um, where's the funding coming from? Who's active on that website? 
Um, you also need to be careful how people interpret their own experiences as well. That's not saying that their experiences are wrong, but it's their experience, it's, it's one person's view. So be careful about relying on that as a trusted source of information. You need several sources. I think the Americans say you need at least three sources to collaborate, um, to corroborate, sorry, a, a fact and make sure you do, you do cross check. And then the other big one, and this is where you'll find a lot of experts get their information from, are medical journals, um, and I work for one. And um, basically there's a big database called PubMed, it's online, and that's a database of all medical research that has been published. It, can, it also includes news stories and features and, and so on and so forth, and it's also wor worth checking stuff out there, but again, you complicated, the language is complicated, it can be dense and this is where having someone that understands the literature can help out and again you need to apply the same kind of scepticism to what um, appears in, on there. Just because something appears in the BMJ or the Lancet doesn't mean it's necessarily right, you need to check out the conflicts of interest, um, you know, talk, talk to people about what appears, you know, both critics and people that might support what appears. What you'll find as well with the med medical research is often that there's a lot of hype in there as well. So the bad stuff doesn't appear, it's what we call publication bias. The bad stuff doesn't appear, but you'll see the good stuff. So again, treat with, treat with caution. I think the overall message I can say really is, is just get what information, when you get information, just treat it with a little bit of, bit of caution and speak to experts or speak to other doctors and just make sure you do your bottom out your bottom out your story